So let's begin like we often do. Let's start with the problem. So let R be the region where 0 is less than or equal to x, less than or equal to 2, and 0 is less than or equal to y, less than or equal to x squared. And we want to find the integral over our region R of 10y e to the power x to the fifth plus 12x cubed sine of 48y minus y cubed. All right. Now notice we're integrating over this region dA. They haven't told us what's the right way to integrate. In other words, should we integrate first with respect to x, or should we integrate first with respect to y? So we have two choices. So to help us figure out what we should do, let's get a quick sketch. So we're told y goes between 0 and x squared. So we can sketch in x squared. So here's y equals x squared. And x is going from 0 here out to 2, which we'll say is here. And so that's our, our region. And uh, this would be at 2 squared, which is supposed to be 4. Well, OK, so not quite to scale, but that's OK. We just need to get sort of an intuition going on. Now, we can integrate in any order. So as a reminder, what are the two orders? Well, we could integrate this way. So where we think about doing slices that way. Now, if we do it there first, what are we doing? Well, that says we're moving x going from 0 to 2. So integral 0 to 2. And then y goes from 0 up to the top. So y would go 0 to x squared of stuff, whatever that turns out to be, dy dx. Our other option is to slice in the other way. So in other words, if we were to slice this way. Now if we do that, what's happening? Well, here, we're going to have our slices are with respect to y. So y goes from 0 to 4. And x goes from, well, whatever that curve is, x goes to 2 at the end. So that's the upper bound. So what's that curve? Well, if y equals x squared, x is the square root of y. Now, actually, x is plus or minus the square root of y. The minus square root of y is that side over there. So we're going from square root of y up to 2 of, again, stuff. But that would be first with respect to x, then with respect to y. So those are our two options. Now, let's think about which one we want. So this one says, uh, if we would like to integrate first with respect to y, this one if we want to integrate first with respect to x. And looking at our, our, our choices here, we say, huh, this part right here, this is really lousy to integrate with respect to x. e to the x to the fifth, how do you do that? See, we, we would prefer this one would be first to it with respect to y because that's an integral you can do. You always prefer the one you can do. And since we can integrate with respect to y, we prefer to integrate first with respect to y. On the other hand, this one, let's look at that. Here, the x part, super easy. But the y part, sine of 48y minus y cubed, ugh. So here, we would prefer to do what? Well, we would prefer dx dy. So which one is it? Do we go dy dx, so we make the first term happy? Or do we go dx dy, and make the second term happy? What's the right answer? And the answer is, we do both. What does that mean? Well, remember, integrals, we can break them up over addition. So because we have that addition, we can say, look, this is the same as the integral over our region of 10y e to the x to the fifth dA plus the integral over our region of 12x cubed sine of 48y minus y cubed dA. So we can break our one integral into two parts. And why? Well, because for each part, there's a preferred way to do it. And we should always say, look, you always want to make things happy. Go with their preferred way. So, 
Now let's just uh, work through. So the first integral, we're going to rewrite that. Remember, this is one where we prefer dy dx, so we're going to use the first option. So, give ourselves a little bit of space. 0 to 2, 0 to x squared, 10 y e x to the fifth dy dx. And the second integral is going to be the second choice, 0 to 4, square root of y to 2 of 12x cubed sine 48y minus y cubed, and then it's dx dy. All right. Well, that's, uh, that's looking promising. So we're just going to keep running these in parallel. 0 to 2. Here, well, we knew it was going to be easy to integrate with respect to, to y. What do we get? Well, 10y, eh, e to the x fifth is a constant. The antiderivative of 10y is 5y squared. And then we have e x to the fifth. And then we're going to evaluate from y equals 0 to y equals x squared. And then once we get that, we're going to go dx plus integral 0 to 4. And here, the sine of 48y minus y cubed, that's a constant because we're integrating with respect to x. So the antiderivative, 12x cubed, well, uh, would be x to the fourth divided by 4, which would give us 3x to the fourth sine 48y minus y cubed, evaluated x equals square root of y, x equals 2, dy. So let's evaluate. Here, Pretty easy to evaluate, because you're going to get a 0 when you plug in 0. So what we end up with is integral 0 to 2 of 5x to the 4th e x to the 5th dx. Plus, over here, 0 to 4. Now, we plug in. Well, I can think of this as a constant. So I'm really plugging in x equals 2. And then I'm going to plug in x equals square root of y. Plug in x equals 2. 3 times 2 to the 4th, that's uh, 3 times 16, 48, minus 3 times the square root of y to the 4th. Well, that would be 3y squared. Then I have sine of 48y minus y cubed dy. Now we're happy. We say, okay. Now, previously we said this e to the x to the fifth, terrible. This sine of 48y minus y cubed, dreadful. But now we're like, lovely. Notice, what's the derivative of x to the fifth? 5x to the fourth. So, this is really e to the u, du. So, this will become e to the x to the fifth, 0 to 2. How about over here? Well, Again, if we look at 48y minus y cubed, the derivative of that is 48 minus 3y squared. So it's sine of u du. Integral of sine is a negative cosine. So negative cosine u. And then we evaluate here, 0 up to 4. So we plug this in. We're going to get e to the power 32, subtract e to the power 0. And for that, we're going to then add, well, minus cosine, well, 48 times 4. That's uh, hmm, 192. Subtract 4 cubed, that's 64. Then we're going to subtract negative cosine of 0. Now, if we, we work this out, minus, minus, wait, do we have enough parentheses? One more for good luck. Minus a minus makes this a plus. And cosine of 0, this is 1. But notice what do you have here? That's e to 0 is also 1, which means that these two terms cancel. All right, what's left? Well, what's left is 
e to the 32 from the first term, then a minus cosine of 192 subtract 64 gives you 128. And that's our answer. Beautiful, beautiful. But what's the moral? Know what you want to integrate. What do your functions prefer? Do you prefer to integrate first with respect to y or with respect to x? Know what your functions want to do. Listen to them. If they want to integrate first with respect to x, let them, let them. Let the problem work itself. That's our goal. That's our goal. Now, what we want to talk about today is we want to talk about uh, integration in a different coordinate system. So we're going to be talking about polar coordinates. And in particular, how can we do integration in polar coordinates? Now, you might say, why do we want to do integration in polar coordinates? And there's a couple reasons why. Something that might happen is it could simplify the way that our region is described. So polar, for example, is very good for circle centering at the origin. Uh, it could also simplify the function that we're dealing with. And remember, our goal in mathematics is to make things simpler. Because if we make things simpler, we have a better chance of succeeding in solving our problems. And that's what we want to do. We want to solve all our problems. So how do we go about doing it? Well, it's important to sort of understand how integration works. And in particular, in particular when we talk about integration, I'm, I'm really talking about definite integrals. So the ones where we're after a number. Every definite integral you'll ever see always has three important things going for it. And so you, once you understand those three things, you can answer what the integral is. And if you're missing any one of those, forget it. Forget it. Can't be done. Can't be done. So what are those three things? So they're, they're marked here. So one thing is, where's our region? And so we have to be able to describe the region that we're integrating. In other words, the part that we're breaking up into pieces. That happens in the bounds. The next thing is, we have to know what we're actually integrating. What's the function? And that's the function. That's where people put all their energy in. They think that integration is always about the function. But remember, it's just one of three things, and all of them are important. The last thing, how do we break R into small parts? And that's what's indicated here in the DA. Because remember, what does integration do? It says, let's take what we're looking for and break things up into small pieces and understand each piece. So we have to understand, well, how do we break things into the small pieces? And once we do, then we're able to answer questions. So let's talk about breaking things into small parts. We'll start with what we're familiar with. So Cartesian. So the way we like to think about breaking things into small parts is we say, let's perturb our, our coordinates. So here you have x and you have y. So if I perturb x, I'm just moving back and forth a little bit in the x direction. If I perturb y, I'm moving back and forth a little bit in the y direction. So when I think about what shape do I perform, if I perturb both x and y, the answer is I form a little tiny rectangle. So I can say, what's the area of that little piece that I've just found? And we call that area of that little piece, that's my bit of area, that's the dA. So area of a rectangle, that's length and width. So dy dx or dx dy. So that's where the dA can be thought of coming from. It's how are you breaking things up? If you think back to slices, that's really what's happening here. So dy says, first take like, for instance, well dy would be a slice like this, and then slice up the x. So that we really are slicing things up according to our different coordinate system. So how about polar? Well, for polar, what do we have? We have to think about what's going on. So I, I still have my same space. Remember, our space does not depend on how we use coordinates to describe things. Rather, our description of things changes. But the space is still the same. So I still have my same space. Now what I want to do is I want to perturb my two 
two different coordinate things. So I have r and I have theta. So I'm going to perturb them and ask the question, all right, if I perturb theta, that's sort of changing the angle at the center. So I have this little bit of slice. The angle here is d theta. If I perturb r, it's how far out I go. So perturbing r and theta, you get this sort of little thing here. You can think of it, if you will, like if you took a, a big pizza, very thin slice, and then you said, I don't like the crust. Maybe I'm on a low carb deal or whatever. So it's not a, a perfectly flat rectangle. It's slightly curved. Now the question is, what's the area? And here's the claim. The area of this piece is, we call it again dA, because again, the area is the bit of area, is r dr d theta, or r d theta dr. Now, the dr and the d theta, that sort of makes sense, because they're talking about perturbation, but is there a reason why we need the r? Let's think about it sort of in, in two ways. Let's think about it just in terms of measurement. Sort of to argue there needs to be something like an r there. If you come back up here, we think about what are x and y. x and y are measuring location, so dx and dy are measurements of distances. How much have we changed in x and y? When we come down here, a dr and r is again, it's a measurement of location. So when I talk about the dr, that's again a measurement of how much I've changed. So it's a measurement of distance. What about d theta? See, theta is not measuring distance, and d theta isn't measuring distance. So when I talk about d theta, that's not a distance. So up here, dx times dy, two distances multiplied together, and lo and behold, we got an area. That makes sense. But down here, dr is a distance, but not d theta. So if I only had dr and d theta, I wouldn't be getting an area. I need a second distance thing. So that's why we need something like the r stepping in. So that we have a distance in the r and a distance in the dr, and therefore we get a square, or rather, I should say, distance times distance for area. Now, that may not be uh, a complete explanation for why it has to be r dr d theta, but it is a reason for why we can't be satisfied with just dr d theta. So to get the whole story, let's recall something. So suppose I have a circle, and here's radius r, and the angle here is alpha. What we can say is by proportionality, alpha is to 2 pi, which says that this angle here, compared to the full revolution, is equal to our area of the slice, 2 pi r squared. All right, that seems fairly reasonable. Okay, so what does that tell us? Well, if we rearrange this, that tells us that the area of a slice is equal to one-half alpha r squared. Okay, so now comes the fun part. So this area here corresponds to the area of this slice. Now, suppose we took our circle and we just puffed it out a little bit. So here, this is the little, we'll call it our dr. Okay? In other words, I just boop, boop, you know, just a little bit, just boop. Okay. So, suppose I wanted to find the area of that little piece there. Again, the crust on the pizza. How would we do it? Well, what would we do? Is we'd say it was one half the angle. Then we take the bigger piece, which would be r plus dr squared. And then we subtract one half the angle and then the just the r squared. So, if you multiply that out, that's one half alpha. That's common to both. I'll go ahead and factor that out. R squared plus two R dr plus 
dr squared minus r squared. The r squareds cancel. And here is the intuition. dr is tiny. dr squared is very, very, very tiny. And so we say, look, this is negligible. So we can ignore it. It's very small. So what's left? Well, multiply the 1 half times 2. And we end up with the angle in the middle times r dr. Now, what if we call the angle in the middle d theta? Lo and behold, now we have all our pieces d theta, r dr, and if you rearrange, you get r dr d theta. So that's how we find our, our area of our little piece. All right. Now, now that we have it, let's uh, do some problems. Okay, so first off, let's suppose we have the following. Find the integral 0 to pi, integral 0 to theta, of pi minus r times r dr d theta. Now, how do we do this? Well, that's not so bad. We can say, look, this is 0 to pi, and then we multiply the r through, 0 to theta, pi r minus r squared, dr d theta. If we integrate with respect to r, because it's dr, that would be 1 half pi r squared minus 1 third r cubed. Evaluate that from r equals 0 up to r equals theta. And then we'll call that d theta. Well, that's not so bad. We just evaluate. 1 half pi theta squared minus 1 third theta cubed. And then when you plug in 0, you get 0. d theta. So, now, this one's not so bad either. We integrate, we're going to get 1 6 pi theta cubed minus 1 12th theta to the fourth, evaluated from 0 to pi, which is 1 6 pi times pi cubed is pi to the fourth, minus 1 12th pi to the fourth. And when you plug in 0, you get 0. So our final answer, a 6 minus a 12th, is 1 12th pi to the 4th. Now you might say, wait, where did polar coordinates come in? And the answer is, it didn't come in. See, once our integral is set up, we integrate the same as before. The only difference between what we did from previous times is that instead of having x's and y's, we have r's and thetas. See, once the integral is set up, integration is integration. So at this point you're saying, okay, so how do we use polar in this problem? Well, the question can become, what does this mean? How do we interpret? What's the right, right way to interpret what's going on? Now, you can interpret it in many different ways, depending upon how you think of your coordinate system. If we were to think of this in terms of polar, then we can start thinking, oh, we could say that this first part this we can think of as our dA. And then this part right here, well, that's telling us what our behavior is. So, for instance, the bounds, 0 to pi, that's our theta bounds. So we could say, okay, this is 0, less than equal to theta, less than equal to pi. And then our r bounds, well, that's from 0 out to theta. So if you sketch this surface, or sorry, this region, what do you get? Well, there's this curve here, r equals theta. This is the Archimedean spiral. It starts at the origin, and as you spin, it goes around. And we're only going from 0 to pi, and therefore our region is this region. Now, we're integrating dA. Okay, so finally, the last thing is, what's this function? Well, what that's telling us here is it's giving us a density. And it's saying that if I pick a point, say that point right here, I, 
One way I, I can interpret it is that if I think of this as a density of pi minus r. So we could think of things that says that when I'm over here, where here, this distance is pi, it's not very dense. But the closer I get to the origin, the denser I get. So this is a very dense material here, less dense over there. And maybe now I want to find something like the mass. So in this case, the integral itself, it doesn't matter whether it's polar or not. The interpretation, that would make a difference whether it's polar or not. And we're going to get more into some of the applications that we can do where things like finding mass and so forth and so on. All right, well, let's do another example. Let R be the region in the first quadrant with 1 less than or equal to x squared plus y squared less than or equal to 9. And we want to find the integral of our region R of log of x squared plus y squared dA. Now, I can't help but notice there's a lot of x squared plus y squared floating around. Now, x squared plus y squared, that's a signal. It's one of the ways that a problem communicates to us. We should be thinking about polar. Now, why does x squared plus y squared say polar? Well, remember, there's a couple basic formulas. x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta, and, of course, a really important one, x squared plus y squared equals r squared. See, the nice thing is x squared plus y squared can be very hard to work with. But r squared, that's not so bad. It doesn't have a plus in the middle. So that's easier to work with. Not trivial, but easier. And, of course, we always like things which are easier. Now there's another thing that suggests polar. Let's talk about our region. We're in the first quadrant, and we're told that 1 is less than or equal to x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to 9. So let's think about what that looks like. First off, let's start with x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to 9. Well, what is x squared plus y squared equals 9? The answer is it's a circle. What's the radius of that circle? It will be 3, because this is r squared, so radius 3. So that says I need to be inside of this circle. On the other hand, x squared plus y squared equals 1. That's a circle with radius 1. And I need to be outside that circle. And so our region that we're working over is going to be this region here. All right, so there we go. There's our, our nice region. Now, if you look at this region, this has a really clean description in polar. So in polar form, what would this be? Well, where does theta go between? The answer is theta equals 0 to theta equals pi halves. So 0 less than or equal to theta less than or equal to pi halves. Where does r go between? And the answer is, whenever you're thinking about r, you always think about coming from the origin. That's your pole. So you come out, and then you follow, and then you stop. So, so r goes from the inner track out to this outer one. So we're going from 1 up to 3. And that is really clean. Now, by comparison, suppose we were going to be foolhardy and say, I don't want to embrace this polar lifestyle. I refuse. I don't want to do it. Well, suppose we wanted to do it in terms of Cartesian. Oh, my gosh, I can already tell this is going to be tough. But suppose we did. Well, what would we have to do? Well, suppose we integrated uh, with the mindset we wanted to do dy dx. So that says, I'm taking my slices like this. Notice, at the start, our slices are going from the top circle to the bottom circle, but then at 1, we transition from the top circle to the line. So what we'd have to have is we'd have to say, well, from 0 
to 1, we are going to go from the bottom curve, which is the square root of 1 minus y squared, oh, sorry, 1 minus x squared, up to the top curve, which is the square root of 9 minus x squared. That would be one of them. And then we'd also have to do from 1 up to 3, and then we would go from the bottom, which is 0, all the way up to the top, square root of 9 minus x squared. We'd have to do it in two parts. Notice that the parts involve square roots. And one of our goals is to get rid of square roots. And that even assumes that we can actually successfully integrate this, which is not so immediately obvious. So if we were to get into it in Cartesian, it would be a much harder thing to do. So we're not going to. We're going to do it in polar. Now let's remember our basic rule of, of integration. Every integral has three parts. The setup, the function, and how we break things up. In polar, that part's very straightforward. That's r dr d theta. The setup for the region, that's what we've already found. So this part right here, we're going to say is an integral integral. And we're going to translate this statement into the bounds. But it's an easy translation. The outer integral is the theta. So that goes 0 to pi halves. And the inner integral is the r. So that's going 1 to 3. All right, so that's our bound. OK, that's our r dr. Now the last part. Well, that's an x and y. I have to get everything in terms of my coordinate system. So everything has to be r's and thetas. But remember, we said x squared plus y squared is a signal. That's going to become r squared. So that's log of r squared. So let's clean this up. Notice log of r squared. Property of log says I can pull the 2 down. So we're going to get 0 to pi halves, 1 to 3 of 2r log of r dr d theta. Now, one thing we can do to make our life easier is to say, hey, notice the bounds. Number to number, number to number. And the inside function, I can separate it into two pieces, one that only involves r and one that only involves theta. In particular, because there's no theta, it's really easy to do. So that says I can really do this in parallel. So I'm going to do 0 to pi halves. I'll put the 2 in here, d theta. And then I also have 1 to 3 of r log of r dr. Now this first integral, you can almost do in your head. It would be 2 theta from 0 to pi halves, which means that this first integral, easy as pi. The second integral, well, that's maybe not as easy as pi. And r log r, this is an integral which you should be able to do, we hope. But if not, we wouldn't expect you to do it in a test. We'd give you a hint. Do you know how to do this one? What do you need to integrate r times log r? Given that, there's two parts. The answer, integration by parts. OK. So maybe we'll do a little bit of work down here in this corner. All right. So if you wanted to do the integral of r log of r dr, you can say, well, one of these things is easy to differentiate. We'll make that our u. The other one, well, not hard to integrate. Ev. So, what would our du be? Our du would be 1 over r, dr. And our v is 1 half r squared. So, this would be uv, 1 half r squared log of r minus the integral of v du. So, 1 half r squared times 1 over r dr. But notice, you can cancel an r, and now that's an easy integral. So you get 1 half r squared log of r, and then minus a half, and integrate r, you get another half, so that's minus a fourth r squared, and then plus c. OK? So back to our regularly scheduled problem. Here we go. This is going to be 
1 half r squared log of r minus 1 fourth r squared evaluated from 1 to 3. If you plug in 3, you'll get 9 halves log of 3 minus 9 fourths. Subtract, if you plug in 1, you're going to get 1 half times 1 times log of 1. Log of 1 is 0. Then you're going to have minus 1 fourth. Well, minus 9 fourths minus minus makes plus 1 fourth. So this would become minus 8 fourths. Or 2, minus 2. So our final answer, if we put this all together, is pi times 9 halves log of 3 minus 2. That's it. And we're done. We're done. Good. And it wasn't so bad. I mean, yes, we had to do integration by parts. But could you imagine having to work with these bands? Ugh. No. You don't want to imagine. It would be terrible. Terrible. Be smart. Don't start. Okay. Well, let's do uh, another one. Fairly similar problem, I think. Because you see right away, our I is drawn, x squared plus y squared. Even without thinking, it's like, ooh, x squared plus y squared, we're probably going to want to do something polar. Now notice, we, we be, in the past we talked about, hey, sine of x squared plus y squared, should I integrate first with respect to x or with respect to y? And the answer is, they're both terrible options. We can't do it. You can't integrate sine of x squared plus y squared. Ugh, too, too tough, too tough. But maybe something can happen. So what can happen here? Well, let's look at our region. Because remember, every integral, you have to have our three parts, our function. Here's our breaking this up. So this part right here, that's our dA. So how are we breaking things up? Well, we're being told that y goes from 0 up to 1. So let's say that's 1. x goes from 0, which is this line right here, out to x equals the square root of 1 minus y squared. Now, you probably know where this is going, but where does this become? We square both sides. That becomes x squared equals 1 minus y squared, or x squared plus y squared equals 1, which means it's going out to the edge of a circle, of radius 1. All right, so that's the region we're integrating over. There we go. Okay, and now we're like, ah, oh, more evidence that polar could be good because circles, particularly circles centered at the origin, are very easy to describe in polar coordinates. And so we think about, okay, so this part right here, this is giving us our r, which is this picture, but we can rewrite this in terms of polar. Let's talk about what does it become in polar. Where does theta go between? Well, we start at 0, and then we're going to keep going up until there. What's that angle? By halves. And where does r go between? Well, again, you always come out from the center, and you go until you stop. Now, in this case, we start at the center. So that says we start at r equals 0, and we go until we hit r equals 1. So now we've updated our description of our region. We need to update our bounds in a moment. r dA, of course, we can switch to r d r d theta. And sine of x squared plus y squared is sine of r squared. So, if we rewrite this integral in polar, we'll get the following. Integral, integral, we'll get the bounds in a second. Sine of r squared, the dx dy, which is dA, becomes r dr d theta. And the bounds, well, the outside are theta bounds, so 0 to pi over 2. And the inside are r bounds, 0 to 1. 
Now, on the surface, it looks like we're doing a very different problem, but we haven't actually changed the problem. The only thing that we've changed between these two steps is our description. How are we describing things? So we're changing our coordinate system, but as before, changing the coordinate system doesn't change what we're doing, it just changes our description. And we're going for a description that's easier for us to work with because, after all, we like things to be easy. Now you might be thinking, okay, great, more integration by parts. But look closely. Are we going to be doing integration by parts? This is not one. Notice we have an r squared. And here, you have an r dr. So, what would happen if we let u equal r squared? du would be 2r dr. And I can divide by 2, so that 1 half du is r dr. So, on the outer layer, 0 to pi halves. The inner layer, that's the, and the inner layer is what we're working on right now. This is the inner layer. That's going to come in terms of u. The r dr, well, that'll become a 1 half du. Sine of r squared becomes sine of u. And the bounds, well, these bounds, these are old bounds. r equals 0, r equals 1. These are the r bounds. They're not the new bounds, they're the old bounds. So we're going from 0 to 1, r equals 0 to r equals 1. See, the new bounds are going to go from u equals something to u equals something. So it's no longer going from 0 to 1. Now we're going to go from 0 to 1. Of course, <laughs> the, we did actually update our bounds. So again, let's not, let's not pretend like we didn't do something. r equals 0 to r equals 1. u equals 0 to u equals 1. It doesn't feel like we changed our bounds because it just happens that 0 squared equals 0 and 1 squared equals 1. It's just a coincidence. Remember, always update your bounds if you're going to do substitution. So, 0 to pi halves, integral of sine is negative cosine. And we're going to evaluate that from 0 to 1. And uh, I should have said u equals 0 to u equals 1. And do that d theta. And uh, we'll end up with integral of 0 to pi halves. And here, we're going to get minus 1 half cosine of 1, and then we're going to subtract minus 1 half cosine of 0. Now, if you look at that, that's just a number. So whatever that number turns out to be, and you can simplify, cosine of 0, by the way, is equal to 1. So minus minus makes a plus. So this is going to be 1 minus cosine of 1 all over 2. That's that number. Then the integral d theta is theta from 0 to pi halves. So our final answer is 1 minus cosine of 1 times pi over 4. Because we're going to have a half, and there's a half there. Together they combine to give us a divided by 4. And there you go. And that wasn't so bad. And look, we couldn't have really started this problem in polar. Because no matter if we did dx, dy, or dy, dx, we'd still have the same problem. How do you integrate sine of x squared plus y squared? And the answer is, you don't. You can't do it. But by changing the way we describe the problem, we went from something we can't do to something which was straightforward to do. That shows you the power of descriptions. And that's why you have to have that flexibility. How do you describe things? How do you make things work? All right, well, this looks like a very different problem. Find uh, C, so we're looking for a number, so that the volume for the set of points with x squared plus y squared less than or equal to z, less than or equal to C, is 8. So let's think about what this is saying here. Let's try to understand what these points look like. Well, x squared plus y squared less than or equal to z. Now, x squared plus y squared equals z, that's not so bad. It's a three-dimensional thing, and the x squared plus y squared equals z, that's one of our sort of go-to examples. That's going to be 
what we call the paraboloid, or more affectionately, that's the bowl. So this is z equals x squared plus y squared. Now, I want to be x squared plus y squared less than or equal to z, which means I want to be in the bowl. It's like I'm pouring points into this bowl. Okay? Now the other part says I want to be below z equals c. So z equals c is a plane. So what we've done is we come through here and we have this plane z equals capital C. And what will happen is that this is going to hit at some point. And so what we have is if we're going to be in between these two things, we're going to end up with the set of points that essentially what we've done is we've raised the level inside the bowl up to a height of C. And our goal is to say, well, how should we set C so that the amount of stuff in the bowl is 8? So it's kind of interesting in that previously we said, oh, here's our region, find our volume. Now we have, here's our volume, figure out what the right setting is for the region. So we flipped it around. What a fun time. Okay, so let's think about how we can proceed. Well, we want to find volume. Now the basic idea for finding volume is we can say, we've been doing this. What we do is we integrate over our region our height, dA. Now what's our region? Well, our region, think about what would happen. So stare down the x-axis. So you're looking down the x-axis. And if you look straight down the x-axis, what you'll see is that this circle where the things intersect, you're going to get that projected down. That's our region down here in the xy plane. So this part down here, this this is R. So what is R? Well, R is where x squared plus y squared, uh, the boundary, the edge, is where we equal C. So we want to be inside of it. So our region is x squared plus y squared less than or equal to C. So this is R. That's R. And now we're like, ooh. That's really good for polar, because of x squared plus y squared. Now, I don't want you to leave today and think, hey, if it's polar, it's always going to be x squared plus y squared. It doesn't have to be the case. But it's, it's going to feel like that after we finish, just because it's a kind of our, our go-to example. It's one that gets used extensively. All right, so now we say, OK, polar. Polar, polar is on our mind. So if we think about this in polar, we say, okay, in polar, our region becomes, well, theta, and if you think, or again, it's a circle of radius uh, square root of c. So in polar, we're going to go all the way around, so theta goes between 0 and 2 pi. Then r, that's how far you go out from the center, we're going to go from 0 all the way out to our radius. So 0 less than or equal to r, less than or equal to square root of c. So that's our region. r dA, because we're going to do polar, that's r d r d theta. And now the height. Well, the height is going to be the difference between these two surfaces. So I'm going from this top surface down until I hit this bottom surface. So it's how far apart these two surfaces are. So what we do is it's the top, C, minus the bottom. Now normally the bottom is x squared plus y squared, but because we're going to go to polar, that's going to become r squared. So what do we get? We get 8, which is our volume, is equal to the integral, integral, c minus r squared times r dr d theta. Theta goes 0 to 2 pi. And r goes from 0 out to square root of c. So 
this becomes integral 0 to 2 pi. Let's think about what we did. Well, the first thing is if we're going to integrate with respect to r, we would multiply the r through. The other thing we can do to save ourselves some time, notice the bounds, they are from between numbers. We don't know what that number c is, but it's going to be a number. So we can actually do the, our little fun thing of like, let's break it up, integral with respect to theta, and here, integral, and now it'll be 0 to square root of c, and it'll be c times r minus r cubed dr. So the first integral, okay, that one we can do in our heads. 2 pi. Easy, easy. The second integral, well, we can almost do that one. Well, what would it be? It would be uh, 1 half c r squared minus 1 fourth r to the fourth. And then we're going to evaluate 0 to the square root of c. Now, when you plug in 0, you get 0. That's good. Plug in square root of c. Square root of, <coughs> square root of c squared. That would be another c. So that's 1 half c squared. Minus, here, be 1 fourth square root of c to the fourth c squared. Put that together. What do you end up with? Well, a half minus a fourth is 1 fourth c squared squared. So, and remember that's multiplied by 2 pi. So we now have that 8 is equal to 2 pi times a fourth, which we can write as pi over 2 times c squared. Well, flip the pi over 2, take it to the other side, so that would become c squared is equal to 16 over pi. Take the square root to get our answer. C is 4 over the square root of pi. Now normally, of course, we get plus or minus, but the problem, we need to have it be positive. Because if C is negative, there's no points which satisfy the inequality, so it must be the positive one. And that's got to be our answer. 4 over the square root of pi. Life is good. Nice. Nice. Great. Good problem. Good problem. Okay. Which brings us to one very nice <clears throat> and very important integral. Find the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of e to the negative x squared dx. Now, you may not know what this looks like off the top of your head, but you've actually seen it a lot. So e to the negative x squared, as you head x towards infinity or negative infinity, it gets very, very small. In fact, it gets small very quickly which is why we have a hope for it to be finite. But when x is 0, it's not so bad. So it turns out to be 1. So what it looks like is it looks like something like this. Now you might say, what is that? You say, I've seen it before, but, but what is it? And uh, normally, this is where I give you a hint and try to, to tell you what it might be. But of course, this isn't just any normal curve, so I'm not going to do my normal hint. Or maybe, maybe I am. All right. So it turns out this is what's called a normal distribution. And in statistics, this is sort of the quintessential distribution. So if you ever have heard of the bell curve, that's this curve. That's the bell curve. And so it's a very important uh, curve, and, and mathematicians and statisticians are very interested in it. So one of the things we'd like to know is, well, how much area is underneath it? So we say, OK, well, that's not so bad. All you have to do is integrate e to the negative x squared. There's a small problem, though. e to the negative x squared does not have a nice antiderivative. In fact, there isn't a nice antiderivative in terms of the functions that we've learned. Now, yes, an antiderivative exists, but we essentially have to create a new function, and we don't want to do that. So we're like, okay, uh, huh, that seems to be kind of the end of our story. 
But now you might be saying, wait a second, hold on. Something else is really fishy here. That's only one variable. This is multivariable. We should be having at least two. You raise a good point, my friend. All right. In fact, that's the way we're going to find this integral, is we can't find this integral using single variable tools, at least not easily. But we can find it pretty easily if we use multivariable tools. So that's what we're going to do. And how are we going to do multivariable tools? Well, let's for a minute, let's call this limit that we want L. Okay, so I don't know what L is, but at the end of the day, and hopefully in about five, 10 minutes, we will know what L is. So we're, we're after L. And the way we're going to find it is we say, okay, let's not find L. Let's find L squared. Huh, okay. Well, L squared, true fact, it turns out L squared is L times L. Okay, so far, no one is very impressed. Well, what is L? Well, it's the integral, negative infinity to infinity, of e to the negative x squared dx. And I'll just write it again, negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative x squared dx. Now, it feels like we've done, the, we're just saying we're going to make this problem twice as long because we're going to do the same thing twice. But now we use the power of names. In math, we can change our names. And sometimes when we change our names, things can get better. We do that all the time. In fact, if you think about what substitution is, one way to think of substitution is we're changing our name. We're changing the way we describe things. So here's our clever trick. If we change this to a Y, it doesn't change what we're after. It's still the same value at the end of the day. I'm just using a Y instead of an X. Okay, all right. Fine, still haven't changed anything yet. But now we're going to do something fun. See, previously we were talking about like, oh, if I have an integral, double integral, I can sometimes pull it apart into two separate integrals. The reverse is also true. If I have two separate integrals, I can push them together. So, if we push these two integrals together, what do we get? Well, it's the integral negative infinity to positive infinity, integral negative infinity to positive infinity of e to the negative x squared times e to the negative y squared dx dy. And this part, you can combine it because the powers of exponents, you'd add the exponents together, it becomes e to the negative x squared plus y squared. And now you're like, ding, 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 ding. We have a winner. That, that looks a lot like what we were doing today. <gasps> because it is. <gasps> we could do a polar thing. Okay, but now we have to think for a second. What's our region R? So our region R is coming from here. This is R. What does R look like? Let's sketch R here in the plane. Well, we want Y to go from negative infinity to positive infinity and X to go from negative infinity to positive infinity which means that our region in the plane is the following. It's everything. So our region is the whole xy plane. Okay, well that's good. So how do we switch it to polar? Well, for polar, how do we describe all points? Well, we let theta, that's gonna go between zero and two pi, full revolution. And then r, well, goes from 0, and then we just keep going. So r starts at 0 and heads out towards infinity. So this is our region in terms of polar. The dx dy, now that is our dA. In polar, r dr d theta. e to the minus x squared plus y squared, e to the minus r squared. So we get the following. Uh, rewriting this in polar, integral, integral, our function is e to the minus r squared. Our dA, which came from dx dy, 
is r dr d theta. Where does theta go between? 0 and 2 pi. Where does r go between? 0 to infinity. Now, you might say, wait, it's, this is an improper integral, isn't it? It is, and you could make it proper by taking limits and so forth. I will assure you that things work out, and we'll see that as we go forward. All right, so now we're making good progress. We can, of course, now separate the, the r part and the theta part, and probably it's easy to do that. So integral 0 to 2 pi d theta, and then we're going to have integral 0 to infinity e to the minus r squared times r dr. And this first integral is going to become 2 pi. That's going to follow us the rest of the way. The second integral, now it's just a single variable. r is our variable. u equals negative r squared. du equals minus 2 r dr. And so I can take that minus 2 across. Minus a half du is r dr. So this becomes the 2 pi from the front. Integral, let's look at our bounds. Well, u equals minus 0 squared. So that's 0. How about minus infinity squared? Well, what we really mean when, of course, when we plug in infinity is what happens as we go to infinity. And the answer is if we square a huge number, we get a really big number. The negative in front says it's a minus. So minus infinity. Then we have e to the minus r squared. That'll become e to the u. And then we have the minus one-half to u replaces the r dr. So I'll put a minus one-half du. Now, I can put that one-half times the two, and if we do, that leaves us with pi. The minus, let's just switch the bounds. Integral from minus infinity up to zero of e to the u du. And now, we have an integral we can work with. Pi e to the u from negative infinity up to zero. Well, plug in zero. e to the zero is one. So then, then times pi. Now plug in negative infinity. e to the negative infinity. Well, again, we can't plug in negative infinity. But when we say plug in negative infinity, it says what happens to e to the u? as you head towards negative infinity, and the answer is it goes away. So that's done. It's gone. It's gone. And life is good. So, is our answer pi? Well, follow it back. And if you follow it back, you'll see that's not our answer. It's the square of our answer. So, that says that our original answer is the square root of pi. So if you've ever taken statistics and say, why do they have a square root of pi showing up in this perfectly looking curve, which has something to do with the exponential function, nothing to do with trigonometry, nothing to do with geometry, really, doesn't feel that way. And the answer is, it actually has some hidden geometry inside of it. In some sense, what we're doing is we're using this sort of rotational symmetry in the plane to carry out the integration. Sometimes people will say the shortest distance between two points, well, is to go along a curved line in a plane that you don't see. Well, maybe, maybe. This is beautiful. It's a beautiful idea. And now we learned a little bit more. And that's it for today. See you next time.